So folks, we am very proud and happy to introduce uh, Andy Sawyer. He's another very good friend, a founding member of the um, Greater Houston Cybersecurity Council, Cyber Houston, a co-captain for the session planning, the summit planning, uh, just an overall a uh, superlative individual. And uh, he is uh, the chief of security and facilities. I recently got promoted to all of secu uh, facilities security. He was the CISO for Lockroy, which is a global law firm. And um, uh, I don't want to burn in a lot of your time. You've got a great presentation about the benefits of cert certification. And a lot of people want to know how we've been getting uh, information on and requests on how do they get a job? What should they be doing? Where should they be looking? So, you know, I think people are looking forward to your uh, conversation. Well, thanks, Umish. And um, I think it'll be uh, fairly, uh, you set the bar pretty high with your introduction here. So, uh, hopefully people won't be too disappointed as we move along, but I appreciate everybody taking the time to, to talk about this really important part of the cybersecurity process today. Um, and um, I think it should, I hope this is a fairly interactive session. Uh, I do have some slides that I wanted to go through just initially and kind of uh, give everybody um, uh, kind of a, uh, uh, some ground groundwork, lay some groundwork and, and talk about uh, what to do in the way of certification and talk a little bit about our uh, journey as a law firm uh, to the certification process and, and kind of where we are and what we see happening going forward with this. So to begin with, um, let's we can bring up the first slide, but here's the first poll question. So uh, we're going to be talking about certification for your for your company or your firm uh, and the value of that. But um, how, how many of you are uh, have a certification or had to have a certification to, uh, to get your job? Um, any, anybody want to weigh in and say, yes, that's me or no, I don't know, I, uh, it's not important. Um, so I think what we'll do is that, uh, you know, maybe you just talk a little bit about the couple of certifications here and then we'll, we'll get people to hopefully, folks, come on, this is an interactive session. We need to be proactive. Uh, the more the merrier, the more people that participate, so tell us what you did, tell us what your certification is. The more people that do it, there'll be more gift cards coming. So. Okay, yeah. thanks, Arish. So, uh, yeah, so again, the, uh, I think it's I'm speaking to an audience that values certification individually and personally and and that's something I look for uh, when I'm making a hiring decision is that it's a given that people have an education, but how relevant is your skill set to the job that you're being asked to do? And certainly the certification speaks to that. So um, I guess the first question when we talk about certification is what does your infosec program look like? Um, are you using NIST or ISO 27001 as a framework for your information security management systems? Do you sell or do you self-identify as being compliant with the standard? We certainly started as saying we're compliant with ISO 27001, but not certified when we were asked by our clients. Do you have a written information security uh, policy? Do you have a written business continuity disaster recovery plan? Do you have a written uh, incident response plan? And you, you know you're doing the right thing if the rest of your company finds you to be unreasonable and, and an impediment to customer service because you're always asking them annoying questions and telling them what they can and can't do. I know that in my firm, I started off by being uh, referred to as Dr. No. I now kind of tell everybody that I'm really Dr. Yes. So I've really just changed the metaphor and said, when I'm asked a question, are we, or can we do this? Um, or how about this? I'll say, yes, we're not doing that, rather than no, we're not doing that. So just changing the metaphor a little bit. But what does your program look like? Let's go on to the next slide. Um, you've probably heard over the last two or three days uh, about frameworks. And um, do, you have a, do you have a framework? Do you follow a framework? So it's probably a good idea to, to ask the question, well, what exactly is a framework? 
It's, um, it's simply a series of documented and agreed upon, understood policies, procedures, processes that define how information is managed in a business to lower risk and vulnerability. We're not living in a risk-free world. Everybody especially knows that since March of this year, but we're looking to manage risk and increase confidence in an ever-connected world. So think of a framework as a blueprint to build an architecture that's modified to meet your needs. Architectures will, will have similar structures and goals, and your architecture will be driven by your business's drivers, securities, regulatory requirements in your industry, your cultures, and your organization. So think of a framework as a blueprint for a, for a two-story house. Many of you will have a two-story house, but inside, most of your houses don't look the same. You have a different number of bedrooms, size of living space. Everything's customized to meet the needs of the individual. So you start with a blueprint or a framework, and then from there, you develop an architecture that actually works for you. Um, there are a variety of architectures out there to choose from, um, and I've listed uh, four here, I'm going to talk about a couple of the ISOs, but uh, generally your information security program should be following a framework, either being certified to the framework or being closely mapped to it. Um, I listed ISO 27001, the ISO series as a start, uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, very comprehensive, very practical, um, a given if you're going to be working with the U.S. government. Um, I also listed COBIT, uh, which has been around a long, long time. It's a very high-level framework, lots of controls, um, not as probably, from my perspective anyway, uh, friendly uh, and easily followed as ISO or NIST, but mostly used in the finance industry to comply with Sarbanes-Oxley, and you may be using that one. So there's no right or wrong here. It's again, which framework helps you build your house best. Um, notice uh, I included ISO 27001 and a fairly new one, ISO 27701, that was introduced in October of 2019 uh, by the International Standards Organization uh, to directly look at your information security systems and your privacy systems and make sure that they're, uh, how your privacy systems stack up uh, in terms of being compliant with required regulatory um, uh, edicts in, that, that you operate in. So first you wanna choose a framework and then we'll go on and look at next. Hey Andy, there were several people that did put in their uh, certifications and stuff. So do you want to kind of scroll through those a little bit? So we've got 70 people online across several people put in their certifications. Should I be seeing those or? Yeah, if you go to the comments tab, you should be able to scroll through. Oh. So Ebenezer says ISA CISM. I'll pop them up. Uh, Liz, can you do me a favor and pop these up to the screen, please? Uh, mm -hmm. Sujit says CISA was a differentiator. C risk, C risk is next in line. Okay. Uh, MCS, CNA, MCITP, CNA, but have a hard time finding a job. Okay. Well, um, you're certainly going down the right path. I guess you need to. Uh, the question to ask is, you know, what industry do you want to work in and what is it that they're looking for? Umesh, I had no idea we had all these smart people on this uh, on this meeting. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I have three certifications myself. I'm seeing a lot of the same ones that uh, that I have. Um, yeah, CISSP, CRISC, um, and... Um, yeah, so I saw a couple of CIS, uh, CISMs uh, certification I have. Uh, CISSP was probably the most challenging. I would say it's the most challenging. They're also different, but uh, CCISO uh, achieving that certification uh, was also challenging and, and directly beneficial to, to the role I serve at the firm. Do you guys support a scaled down cyber 
certification, smaller and more scalable than SOC 2 or ISO 27001. Well, let's talk through ISO 27001. I think it, it comes across as being daunting, particularly when you buy the standard in Swiss francs and you think, oh my gosh, what have I got myself into here? So uh, let's talk through the process a little bit and then see if, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a roadmap and, and you're always going to be working through certification and through improving your information security systems. So um, there's, a good, there's a good place to start and I'll talk a little bit about what we've done uh, and see if you can bite off manageable chunks of ISO certification and then see what the next step is as we go forward. Uh, but excellent feedback, lots of certified folks on here. Uh, we're gonna talk mostly about shifting from personal certifications to um, making sure that your clients and your customers think your organization is up to snuff as well. So um, let's maybe go back and look through a couple more of the slides here. So what is ISO? ISO is the International Organiz uh, Organization for Standardization. Big mouthful there. Um, been around a long time. Lots of different ISO certifications that are out there. Uh, anywhere from manufacturing to electronics to uh, anything you can name. Uh, but the ISO 27001 certification uh, is a really well, highly recognized standard for information uh, implementing, maintaining, and continually improving a risk-based ISMS. And what's a risk-based ISMS? It's an information security management system. So two schools of thought on um, information security management. You either manage risks or you manage vulnerabilities. Uh, you get the list of CVEs on a weekly basis that say these are all the vulnerabilities that are out there. And you wanna patch all your systems for those vulnerabilities, and make sure that you know, you're up to date and you're not just making it easy for the hackers. But the question to ask yourself is, do those vulnerabilities even apply to me? If I'm only patching for vulnerabilities, I'm never really uh, sure if I'm actually managing the risks that are important to my firm. So uh, ISO is a risk-based, as is NIST, a risk-based approach to managing information security. Um, and again, I mentioned that 27701 uh, specifies the requirements for establishing, implementing, and maintaining a risk-based privacy information management system. Uh, 27701 came out last fall, and it is a contingent certification. You have to have 27001 to get 27701. You can't just go out and say, we're going to uh, get certified for uh, ISO 27701 because we want our uh, customers to know that we carefully manage the privacy of the information that they provide to us. So it's a contingent, you have to have the one to get the other. We'll talk a little bit about both as we go forward. So why did we choose ISO 27001, 27701 certification? This was complete, this was for the most part client driven. Um, our clients started asking us probably five years ago uh, what certifications do you have? Uh, the legal industry, particularly the big law industry that we operate in, is highly competitive. Um, people like to deal with specific attorneys and have long-term relationships with attorneys, but uh, attorneys move from one uh, law firm to the other. And um, many of uh, the big law firms have the same clients that will move uh, with them if they feel like they're, they're exposed to risk that other firms don't have. So the, the one thing that uh, we saw, other than being client driven, is that having a certification process enforces a discipline for the assessment and treatment of risks that's tailored to the needs of the organization. So ISO particularly, and, and NIST as well, and I'm not saying that one is better than the other. If you're NIST driven, that's completely uh, great. Uh, we went down the ISO path uh, because that's where we saw most of our clients expressing interest. 
and most of our peers uh, being in that same area as well, going for 27,001 certification. But it enforces a discipline. It communicates to clients and stakeholders uh, that you value information security and privacy. And it provides in independent verification. So this is the who besides you says so piece um, that you're complying with uh, best practices uh, and that you stack your policies, procedures, and controls against a, up against a highly recognized and respected international standard. It forces you to do ongoing risk assessments and audits, um, and it requires demonstrable evidence of continual improvement. For us to maintain our certification on an annual basis, we have to demonstrate that we are doing things uh, better than we were last year. And it's far more than technical. It's all about uh, business uh, policies and procedures and your employees buying in and being part of the solution. So this is uh, the reason that we went after the ISO 27001 certification. So let's look at the next. It's Again, I talked a little bit of, uh, before about it's a holistic view of your organization. It's not just technical. It's not just do you have firewalls? Do you have an access control policy? Do you uh, terminate people when they leave? Do you have uh, encryption at rest? Do you have encryption in motion? It's not just a technical uh, certification. Uh, they want to know uh, how you're handling uh, HR, how you're handling suppliers, how you're uh, hand how you're uh, providing security awareness training to your employees. Uh, in my firm, we have uh, the attorneys that uh, own the firm. They're the partners of the firm. Um, and there are professionals and then we have staff. And so uh, I have some things that I can just require staff to do and some things that I can encourage and compel the attorneys to do, but I can't enforce the, the attorney attendance at a, at a particular security train, uh, awareness training session. But the client wants to know, does my attorney know what's going on? So I have to be able to demonstrate that the attorney's been trained, they uh, they have the tools, and they're participating. Um, and they want to look at non-disclosure agreements. And if you're going after uh, privacy certification, they want to look at your data processing addendums and your privacy impact assessments um, and review those and check the boxes on those. Um, beyond uh, physical data center security, do you have uh, key card access, locked door surveillance, what's your travel policy, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a holistic view of the controls that you have in place to provide an ongoing information security management system. Next. So what do you certify? Um, we, when we decided to go uh, all in to, when we decided to go after ISO 27001 certification, we went all in. Uh, and this maybe speaks to the question before about ISO 27001 being too big to get my head around. Um, you don't have to certify everything, but you do want to identify the information assets that distinguish your business and make you different and better than others. So, um, for example, here we've uh, certified all of these information assets. We view email as an asset, our document management system as an asset, uh, client share services. This is how we collaborate in data rooms with clients, uh, mobile device management. So we've listed all of these assets. Some of my peers will only uh, certify one or two assets. They might certify their document management system and email, uh, but Decide what you want to start with. You can add as you go. Uh, on The more you certify, the longer the audit is and the more control questions that come into play for you. Uh, but figure out where, you, where a good starting point is for you and then go from there. Um, whatever you decide to certify, there's a fixed set of uh, control objectives in ISO. And you're gonna find that some are applicable to you, some are not applicable, uh, that you already meet. Uh, you'll be surprised to find that you meet many of the control objectives already. And some you need attention to and some you just flat don't meet yet. And those are the ones you need to work on for your audit. 
So there's a pretty well-defined roadmap to get there from here. But everybody starts off at the same place with a gap analysis. Then let's go on and say, what's required to actually do ISO certification? Number one, you have to have the support of the executives in your, in your company or it just flat won't work. Uh, not only won't it work, but you can't get certified because it's a key requirement of the certification process that top management be bought in because this is business objective driven. Um, it has to be pervasive throughout your company and it has to address the stakeholders, which in many cases are your clients or customers, but they're also going to be government entities as well. Uh, certification requires time and money. Uh, it won't be something that you'll go out and do on your own and come back and say, good news, everybody, we got, uh, we got certified. You actually have to own and know the standard, uh, the ISO 27001 standard. You will buy it from ISO. Um, the transaction occurs in Swiss francs. Um, and your uh, copy is watermarked. Um, so don't show up to the audit with a copy that you borrowed from somebody else. Uh, that's really a pretty big red flag. Um, and then um, you're, uh, it's required that you have policies, plans, and controls that are uh, consistent with the standard, um, that you provide training and awareness. Lots and lots of documentation is required here. And although it's optional, I highly recommend that you not pursue this on your own, that you hire a consultant to help you through the process uh, because they will know uh, it's, it's a little to me like uh, working in the legal industry. You often want to answer the question that isn't asked and you should only answer the questions that are asked. So consultants will help, you know, put your packages together for you, for the auditors, but they'll also help coach you through the audit so that you're not giving out information that leads the auditor to ask something else that's out of scope. So those are the basic requirements. Um, as I said before, made the comment that ISO is a risk-based framework for security. Would you also say that the NIST frameworks are that way? Yes, I would. So uh, NIST uh, uses the five uh, the five components, but it's all risk driven, identifying what your assets are, uh, what your protection uh, is, what your response is. Uh, so definitely NIST is, um, uh, is risk based as is ISO. And you, Michael, you just let us right up to what is risk management all about. So um, Michael and I didn't talk before this incidentally. Um, is ISO certification applicable to on-premise and cloud-based computing? Yes, it is. Um, because risk is, exists on-prem, a lot of us may, may feel like, you know, I have a, I keep everything in my castle and my, my, the walls of my castle are really high and nobody can get over them. And so I'm really protected here on-prem. Risk exists whether you're, you're internal or whether your footprint is digital uh, and cloud-based. So uh, you're always going to have risk. So as we talk about risk in the, uh, in the information security end of the business, uh, a risk exists when you have an asset that's vulnerable to a threat. I think everybody is pretty comfortable with that definition for information security. Um, so what's the process of, of managing risk? Let's look through the next step. You begin with a risk assessment. And this is, a, this is a process that you, I say you begin with, but it's an ongoing process. You must really do, to maintain ISO certification, you have to have a risk assessment formally done on an annual basis or after you have an incident, a security incident, or when you have a significant change in your environment. So any one of those events will trigger a new risk assessment. What are the components of a risk assessment? Begins with an analysis. Um, I can't remember who sang the song, but there was this uh, back, uh, there was a song that was popular a long time ago that says, uh, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. But the first thing you do is to identify what your assets are. What is it that you're, that you're trying to protect? 
what information technology or what technology do you have that if it went away this afternoon would stop you from servicing your your customers or your uh, or your clients? Uh, what asset do you have that if it was down for six weeks would be the reason that you went out of business or even a shorter time period than that? So the first thing you have to do is identify your information assets and value those. Email is the most important thing to us. Uh, document management is the most important thing to us. Our website is the most important thing to us. Those are your assets. Then you go through the process of saying, we've identified the three assets that keep us in business and keep us providing customer service. What are the threats to those assets? Um, again, it, it's helpful to be talking to others in your industry. Uh, we use a standard uh, program to uh, list out threats to information assets uh, like email, like uh, document management, like remote access. So identify what threats exist in the wild to the assets that you have and then be honest about how vulnerable you are to those threats. So the risk analysis begins with identification and then you have to rank uh, risks by saying this value is, the this asset email is our most valuable. So uh, the threat level that we see in the wild to email is very high and it seems to me that we're pretty vulnerable to uh, phishing emails and malware emails and ransomware emails. And maybe we've had experience in that area that we would uh, soon forget. But let's just say that email uh, risks are very high for us. Um, then you go on to the next step by you take all of your assets, you identify what threats exists, and you're going to have multiple threats to the same asset. And you may have the same threat across assets as, uh, across assets as, as well. And then you go to the next step uh, by prioritizing risks. So we drop our risks into four buckets. We say that we have uh, critical, high, medium, and low risk uh, uh, that we need to address. We always identify the uh, we draw a line and say, if it's below this line, it's a medium or low. And yes, we recognize it's a risk. And yes, it's something we're going to definitely uh, pay attention to. And we're going to develop a plan to resolve it. But before we get to the medium risks or the low risks, we're going to work on those things that are really critical risks to us because we need to drive them down to what we call uh, center point acceptance, which is something we can tolerate. Uh, while we're addressing other critical or other high risk areas, your uh, uh, information security and certification is not the absence of risk, it's the recognition of risk. Um, who knows who's saying you don't know what you got till it's gone? I want to say it was Joni Mitchell, but it could be wrong about that. But somebody on this on this meeting will know. Um, and um, so you're, you're, you want to basically address the risks that you've got. Uh, again, you're never going to be in a, in a zero risk environment. Risk is always going to exist. You're going to figure out how to deal with it and how to drive it down to the, uh, a, a, a level that is acceptable to you. So you prioritize as you, uh, by doing a risk assessment, you've identified I have 10 threats to my most important assets and, I, and some of those are really critical and some of them are high. I need to make a plan to, to, to manage these risks. One of, they're really one of four ways that we, that we treat risk. We either avoid the risk altogether. Uh, we might say, you know, this email thing is just way too risky for us. We're gonna stop having email addresses. We're just not gonna communicate with our clients by email. Um, and then at that point, if you shut down your email servers, you've clearly avoided the risk of any threats that might happen in the, in the area of email. Probably not a good overall business decision that your executives are gonna buy into, but certainly risk avoidance is a way to treat risk. 
Uh, a second way to treat risk is to transfer risk. Uh, cybersecurity insurance is a, is a way that you can transfer risk liability uh, by saying, we're going to have cybersecurity incidents. They're going to cost money. We're going to transfer that to um, a cyber uh, to an insurance company to compensate us for that risk, or uh, you can transfer some risk to an outside uh, uh, service provider. That's risk transfer. You might say we're really not very good at email. We want somebody else to handle that problem for us. Are you still responsible for email? Yes, but are you transferring some of the risk of email management to someone else? Yes. So. Another way to deal with risk is to simply accept it and say, you know what, we're okay with uh, uh, having this risk. We can live with it. Um, it's, you know, if you think of it as um, operating at room temperature, that's different for all for each of us. Some of us are more comfortable with it being 70, 70 degrees than 74 degrees. But if your temperature is that you're comfortable accepting risk at a certain level, then you just accept it and recognize that that's not something we're gonna pay a great deal of attention to right now. But for most of us on the meeting, we wanna reduce risk. We're gonna particularly wanna look at those critical and high risks and come up with a plan to reduce them. So let's go on to, um, this was the process that we went, we went through to get ISO certification. Focus on risk and risk reduction. 100% um, secure and 0% zero risk, zero risk is simply not, a, not possible. So that can't be your goal. To decide who's responsible for what um, in your information security uh, team and keep that list fairly small. I think when I started out, I said, oh, you know what? I'm going to have these 10 people uh, will be involved in my information security team. And my consultant said, that's a really bad idea. You want to keep that number to uh, four or five because they're all going to get asked questions. Everybody you include will get asked questions during your audit and makes your audit longer and makes you responsible for everybody's answers. So keep, your, uh, keep this group of people fairly manageable and fairly low. You will have different people that are business process owners than uh, information security uh, team members. Keep the information security team member list fairly small. Define what your scope is. What is it that you're going to certify? Are you certifying email, website? Come up with that list. Again, start small and, and grow that as you go forward. You have to do a risk assessment. It's best to have that done by someone that uh, is external to the organization, or at least someone that's uh, uh, independent and not necessarily trying to say, you know, our company's great. We just don't have that many risks to deal with. Uh, nobody's going to believe that. So get some independent help on that piece. You end up coming up with what's called a statement of applicability for ISO certification that says, because you're identifying these assets and because you're in this type of business, these are the controls and policies and processes that you're gonna get asked questions about. Um, and you really need to know the standard. You need to know um, who your stakeholders are, who your uh, interested parties are, uh, who's on your ISF, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of details in the document. That's why you buy the ISO standard. Um, you develop risk analysis and risk treatment plans. Uh, there's a process to go through to get certification. You have to do an internal audit um, on an annual basis. Uh, we're a, a big law firm, but we don't have an internal audit function. Um, many of you on the call probably do have an internal audit department. We do not. So we have to hire an external entity to perform an internal audit for us. Um, and um, they're they're good at what they do. Uh, I probably most people on the call are not huge fans of the internal audit department unless you work there. Um, then you do a stage one audit, which is to review all of your ISO documentation to make sure that it 
is correct, that auditor will know everything there is to know about the ISO standard, and they'll be looking for your specific documentation and how it lines up to that standard. And then the stage two audit is to look at your, your internal policies, processes, and controls and make sure that they are compliant uh, with what the ISO standard calls out. And then finally, you receive certification. Um, that process for us, start to stop, was a little over 14 months. Um, some of my peers, uh, and I felt like we were pretty well positioned for it. Uh, some of my peers were in the 24 to 36 month range to get certified. Uh, so we moved pretty quickly through it. Um, and um, that's, that's really kind of a, that's a high level of kind of where you get, you know, where you're going with this thing. And I think we're down to, I've probably worn you all out with slides, but I think we're down to one more. 27,001 certified, if that's the certification you're going for. Uh, it's good for three years. At the, the first year, you go through all the controls, all the documents. Um, you have two surveillance years, or th then you have surveillance years, and then you'll go through a third of the controls, a third of the documents uh, every surveillance year. You have to have bi-monthly information security forums, uh, I conduct these in my firm. You have to have people from every part of your company participate in the for forum. You have to keep minutes. You get asked for those. Uh, you can't just show up at the next audit and say, you know, we really didn't do those bi-monthly meetings because we didn't need to. Um, you have to establish metrics because again, it's a continual improvement process. Uh, so you have to be able to say, uh, we have a click rate on our internal phishing simulations of about 30%. We really want that to be 5%. How are we going to get to 5% from 30%? And what kind of progress are we making? So you have to establish metrics for the assets that you're protecting. And uh, again, there are some pretty well-defined lists of things you could look for, like uh, memory utilization, disk utilization, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Liz pulled the, the, uh, the slide on me. So I think we're, I'm, I'm through talking and ready to hear, you know, for you all to jump in and start asking some questions. And uh, I'll either answer or act like I know the answer. One of those two things is going to happen. So with that... Hey, Andy, good. Uh, that was uh, a really good deep dive, especially into the ISO certifications. Um, so there is a question. We, you'd already answered a couple, but there are a couple of comments and stuff. So let's go through some of them. Uh, Sujit says, does ISO dictate which framework you have to use to do risk assessment? Which one would you recommend one from your experience? Now, you did cover some of it in your talk, but maybe you can address it in more detail. Um, ISO has, that's a great question, uh, Sujit. Uh, they actually make it pretty easy for you. I ran through the one slide was really kind of a compilation of two of the ISO documents. Uh, the, do the slide, which is uh, talked about risk management, they do provide a framework for risk management, which includes uh, you know, risk assessment, uh, risk identification, risk evaluation, risk treatment. So um, that's a real high level framework. And obviously it plugs in differently for, for each of you, but to, for the ISO certification, you're gonna wanna use the words that they use or explain to them, this is the language I use and this is the framework I use to get there. So, um, uh, I would encourage you to go out and just Google ISO 27001 uh, risk assessment and you'll get their, their two, two documents that'll pop up. Uh, right, so you touched upon, so shifting gears just a little bit, I, sure. I just have a question for you. So you touched upon the NIST framework and you know we hear so much about 800-53 
and that's right. been the uh, established standard. And recently, they've kind of also brought out or given more beef to 800-171, where you're talking about primes and subcontractors, and that has some far-reaching consequences. Uh, do you have any experience in that? Um, I do not, only because we don't align to NIST. Uh, I think it's a great framework. I actually think in some ways it can be much more practical and a little easier roadmap. Uh, particularly for a small to medium-sized business to follow. Uh, but I can tell you that in our industry, it's not driven that way. Um, and so for us, if we had pursued NIST certification, we would have been perceived, at least among our clients, as I wonder why you guys are doing this different than everybody else in your business. What is it you're trying to hide? So uh, uh, in, in our business, because it's, professional client relationship. We provide a professional service. Uh, we don't process data for, uh, for our clients. Our clients uh, send us documentation. We provide legal opinions. We go to court for them. Uh, we obtain uh, trademarks, patents, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we're dealing mostly on pretty on, I wouldn't call it low volume, but direct communication uh, with uh, a specific entity. So NIST in our industry wasn't the way that we saw going, but it certainly is maturing much uh, as quickly as what ISO is. I was impressed to see ISO come out with the 27701 last fall uh, because it's, it said that, you know, we're trying to be progressive and recognize the times and we're not just sitting over here uh, in our ivory tower, throwing out edicts about what's the best thing to do. They're, they're adapting, and certainly NIST is too. Uh, and I, I would suspect that probably a lot of folks on the call uh, or on the meeting are, uh, are NIST-driven, which is certainly great. I think those are the two drivers that I see out there. And so, you know, you mentioned, uh, you had a little conversation around, let me preface, back that up. As a global law firm, I'm sure that you have a lot of cross-border considerations and uh, privacy is different depending on where your client is located or in all the different jurisdictions that your clients are located. Uh, and when you spoke about the privacy assessment requirements that you're seeing some of your clients uh, request of you, what are they really, what are the things, what are the top one or two things that they're really looking for, especially in a global situation? Well, they're looking for, um, and I would say that Europe has, has been way, way ahead of uh, the U.S. Uh, in terms of uh, privacy and privacy protection. But our clients are really looking for what personal information do you have of ours? Why do you have it? How could you get by with less of it? Um, and who do you disclose it to? And be open about it. And, you know, if I have uh, private information, personally identifiable information on individuals that the client has provided me or in, and including the client, um, am I minimizing that data? Am I protecting it? Who am I required to disclose it to? Am I open about it? Do I provide... Um, the ability for the client to rest uh, to rectify it. Can I give you Umish? Here's all the private information I have about you. Uh, you need the right to re redress. You need to be able to say, "Gosh, Andy, that's not right." You know that hasn't been the case for ten years. So I need to be able to correct my own information. Um, we have a lot of. Uh, I think anybody on this meeting would say. There's a lot, there are a lot of competing legislations and regulatory requirements out there now. The U.S. is catching up uh, or on in catch-up mode with uh, Europe. Uh, I was surprised when we started pursuing privacy a couple of years ago to find out that the U.S. is one of those countries that's viewed by Europe as untrusted. So data on Europeans in the United States is generally seen as not a good thing because uh, we tend to be consumer. We see privacy as more of a consumer issue than a than uh, an individual right. 
uh, as the Europeans see it. I think we're catching up to that. I would say that CCPA that uh, is still in process and came out um, um, last last summer um, is in many ways much more comprehensive than some of the legislation that we've seen that we've been compliant with in Europe for a long, long time. And so I think CCPA, some of the individual states that are coming out with their own privacy requirements uh, is all headed in a, in a really good direction um, for the individual consumer. We've had to substantially change our public facing website uh, so that people can come and say, hey, I want to see what information you have about me. And hey, I want to be able to correct it. I want to be able to ask you to delete it. There's something called the right to be forgotten. Uh, and certainly people can ask to be forgotten by your company. And so um, there are many uh, congratulatory comments coming in, oh. and people saying you've done a great presentation, thank you, et cetera. Yes. Sujith has a follow-up question and says, what would you say the overall cost associated with ISO certification is a ballpark? Um, you know, I, I don't know. If, it, if it's a ballpark, it's one that the Dodgers and Rays can't hit out of. But, uh, but I would say... Um, it really depends on what you want to certify. Uh, I encourage you to start small and say, let's certify this process. Let's certify this asset. Um, if you want to uh, work with other firms that have gone through the process and, and not involve a consultant, that's certainly going to make it less expensive. Um, so, you know, you might... You know, time and money wise, I would probably think of it as being something that's going to be a six figure uh, project on an annual basis uh, in terms of your time, your people's time, uh, whether you involve a consultant or not. Um, but it's certainly not inexpensive. And at the end of the day, it has to add value. Uh, why is it valuable to me to have an ISO certification? Um I have probably half a dozen clients a week that want to know how secure we are. And they will send me, uh, think of it as an IRS audit. I get IRS audits half a, half a dozen times a week. Some of them only ask me 50 questions. Some of them ask me 650 questions. Um, and they want the answers, you know, detailed response send us screenshots, send us documents, do this, that, and the other. And then they'll come on site to, to check us out anyway. Since we've been ISO certified in the two and a half years that we've been ISO certified, um, I always respond first to those questionnaires with, here's my ISO certification. Would you like to continue or does this su suffice? And probably in 75% of the cases, uh, that's the deal that saves me time to go on and actually take care of something else. I send them the ISO cert. They're happy. They're ready for us to move on. They're, they trust us. It's that external assurance that ISO gives us that's really valuable to me. Yeah, so I think you're touching on the very next point I was going to ask you because you had made a point to say that, you know, ISO certification and these certifications can be a competitive differentiator. Right. And uh, you just kind of also touched on something that we have found a lot in our businesses that the um, assessments and the self, um, uh, you know, the, the questionnaires that are being sent to us by our customers that say, please fill this out. And they vary a lot. Uh, some are all about how are you protecting your information? Some are right. about what are the steps you're taking? Some are about when was your, when you show us a copy of your business continuity plan. I mean, it's just it just varies all over the board. So when you're talking about competitiveness and where does that bar, where, you know, um, if you're competing, you really don't know what your competitor has as far as certification. So right. what, what would you, what advice would you have for people that says, where do you at least draw the line? Oh, boy, that's a good question. So, uh, you know, I think you, you want to decide what, what can we bite off and be successful with? Uh, what can we say? We're really good at this. And, we can, and we're proud to tell our customers that they're in good hands with us in this area. 
we decided we were fairly late uh, in terms of an AMLA 100 firm. Wouldn't say we were late, but we were not the first people to go out there and go after ISO certification. But when we decided to do it, uh, we decided we were all in. So some of my peers will certify two, two information assets. I mentioned that before. We certify 12. Nobody certifies more than we do. Uh, it makes our audits longer. It makes them more comprehensive. But you know what? When I send that cert to my, to my client, I just kind of remind them we're all in. Everything that uh, uh, you touch with us, it's certified. Uh, if you have a small list, they're going to say, well, what about your lit support services? What about remote access? What are you guys doing about this? So clients are informed. They know what to ask. So uh, I think it's good to be as committed and as whatever certification you go after, commit to it. Uh, and again, it's, it's in your best interest to stay out of the headlines. Certification doesn't mean you're not going to have a breach. It means you're going to know what to do when you have one. Uh, it's not a guarantee, uh, but it's certainly a uh, demonstration to your clients that you've made a best effort to get there. And we've got a couple of comments. Andy from our um, group says we recommended uh, we recommend the CIS, CSF, or SMBs to start and then grow to the end list. Um, then we see that uh, Michael is saying another issue with privacy in the U.S. is there's no federal policy act as noted by those that he deals with, with uh, Europe and, and Australia, that's correct. You know, I mean, it's, uh, right. it's a good observation there. Yeah, I think that's great. And just to respond to both of those comments, I think, you know, uh, security is a, is, a, is a journey, not a destination. Uh, you certainly, you know, want to be on the, on the road uh, and start with what you can do well, as I said, Start with a certification you can do well, as you did individually, so for your business, uh, and then keep moving up and getting better as you go on. And yes, Michael, I completely agree with you on the privacy laws in the U.S. It is a challenge because we operate in so many states to, uh, to figure out which uh, privacy laws we're subject to. I'm very fortunate in that I have a privacy and cybersecurity practice group uh, and they attend my bi-monthly cybersecurity for, uh, information security forums, and they lead off every month. And they say, Andy, here's what we're doing in Illinois. Here's what we're, we're having to do in Massachusetts now. Here's what we're having to do in Florida now. So uh, it is confusing. It is a challenge. And it would be, I would say it would be great if there was a U.S. National Privacy Act similar to what GDPR is in the in. European Union, but we're not there yet. And we may never get there because we're Americans and we like to do things independently. So Andy, this has been an awesome presentation, a lot of great interaction, always interesting to get into that head of yours. And, you know, we could spend a whole day talking about stuff and you're just always constantly lifting the bar. There was a, a couple of people have asked about slight presentations and whether we will be providing the slight presentations from the summit. Uh, so for all of you that are out there viewing right now uh, across all three channels on uh, YouTube and a couple of Facebook channels, that um, we will check with our presenters and see who all are willing to give us their slide decks. And we will publish those under the resources tab at the um, cyberhouston.org slash resources. URL. So that's again cyberhouston.org slash resources. The other thing that we will be doing is that we will be downloading these day-long videos and breaking them up and, and producing session-based videos and roll those out over the next couple of weeks on the YouTube channel for Cyber Houston. So that's what we will be doing. And so, um, Andy, again, thank you very much. Do you have a parting word of encouragement? You've already told us, start small and don't bite off more than you can chew. Exactly. And I, and I would say pursue, you know, pursue uh, certification. It certainly enforces uh, a regimen. And I, and I would say that many of you are probably our clients and each of us makes all of us better. So, um, uh, 
uh, again, my slides will be available uh, certainly because I think it, it helps me to help. If, if anything I've said is helpful to you, it certainly is helpful to me uh, to have you be more secure. And that's really the goal of Cyber Houston is to make the Houston uh, business community more cyber resilient. That's what we're all about. Thank you for everything you do, and thank you for all the support. And uh, couldn't do it without uh, you and great corporate citizens like you, yourself and Lockport. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye now. Okay, bye.